the first speaker of the day, um, Mr. Simon Parent. Simon Parent is owner of Nova, Nova Fruit, a strawberry and raspberry plant nursery located in Quebec that specializes in plug and tray plants. He regularly visits producers and researchers abroad to adopt the latest techniques and transfer them to industry. Simone is very much interested at very much involved at all levels of the production chain from breeding to marketing of fruits and he is a member of several committees and working groups. He is currently president of the North American Strawberry Growers Association who's hosting this webinar series and sits on the coordinating board of the Quebec Strawberry Grower Association in order to participate in the development of the sector and to make sure that the technological developments in the company match the market's needs. Simon? Yeah, thank you very much, Caddy. I'm very impressed with your good uh, French pronunciation. <laughs> I'll try to do the same in English then. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, Dana Charles Strawberry Production webinar. These kinds of interactive web events sounds really new to us, but will become a standard definitely in the years to come. It will never replace any personal meetings or the friendly relations that we share during congresses and conferences, but it really has the advantage of putting together people that live far away f from each other on the same network to discuss a particular subject. So, uh, the topic I will approach today is growing systems used for denatural strawberry production. I will first shortly explain how denatural are developing in North America among different climates and among other growing systems. And then I will discuss the different production scheme used in the northeast of our continent to make denatural production complementary and profitable with bare roots or plug plants. So let's get started. As you know, uh, North America is a very vast continent with a lot of climatic zones. And fortunately for us, Strawberries are known among the most adaptable cultivated crop that will fit well in the most various condition. So acreages of strawberries are grown all over the continent. The, ta the data you see on this slide are from different sources and different years of reference. So my numbers might not be all up to date, but I just want to give you a general portrait. So you can see here some of the most important production sites in North America, illustrated here with red circles, which are proportional to the acreage. Eastern Canada is, is a big player, over 10,000 acres. It is about the same in the north and mid-east of the United States. And then there is more than 7,000 acres, I think now it's close to 10,000, in the very south, south uh, concentrated around uh, Tampa in Florida. And California has close to 40,000 acres spread over the state. So on the following slide, uh, instead of acreage, you can see the average yield in each region. Therefore, the scheme is different. To explain this difference, let me remind you a few basics of physiology. It is really important that you all understand this before we go further. Remember that strawberry is a very adaptable species and it is a reason why it is so fascinating to work with. You can crop the same plants in different environment and they will react in a completely different manner. Many people don't really know why summer bearing strawberries are called short day varieties. So then let me explain. It is because summer bearing varieties build flower buds in the crowns during the short days in fall and those flowers will come out and bear fruit only in the spring. So it is a combination of short days and cool climate that will induce flower bud initiation in short days cultivar. In the north, uh, this process takes place in the fall and the plants bear fruit in the spring. However, under lower latitudes, like in Florida, growing conditions are good all winter long, while the dayland stays short. So even the short day varieties that normally crops only three, four weeks in the north, they will give a continuous supply of fruit over four or five months in the south. So, well, this is for the short day types. On the other hand, day neutral varieties will grow flower bud even when the days are long and temperatures are warm. So then even in northern latitudes, they will give a continuous production all over the summer season, therefore stretching the picking season from one month to five months. So let's get back again a few slides and have a second look at acreage. So then let me show you again the average yield that is increasing as you go south, mainly because as I explained of a longer picking season. 
And then fasten your seat belt. Total yield. Here California and Florida take most of the screen and they grow an enormous proportion of North American strawberries. This is because their season is longer and their yields are higher. I will always remember a conference given by Tom Julian from Driscoll at the Nazga Congress who told us that the only way the North could, sur could survive California's competition is by adopting new growing systems that will stretch the season and increase the yields. And he pointed out day neutral varieties as the most obvious option in regards to the international trends at our latitude. One of the advantage we have in the North is that many of the commercial day neutral varieties actually available do not support well intense heat, restricting continuous summer production to areas where the summers are not too hot, meaning in northern latitudes or at high altitudes. Now I will get into the more technical part of my speech, and I will use Quebec strawberry grower system uh, as a reference. So all the dates and yields that, that I will show are for a humid continental climate at latitude 48 degree north. In Quebec, day neutral strawberries occupy around 20% of our strawberry fields. More than 40 years ago, California and Florida growers adopted a new growing system on raised bed covered with plastic mulch and drip irrigation. More than 30 years ago, North Carolina growers followed introducing new plant types and varieties. 20 years ago, the Northern growers also started to do the same with day neutral varieties and they adapted the system to their condition. All day neutrals grown in the Northeast are, are grown on plastic culture. It does not seem to be profitable to grow day neutrals in the traditional matted row system. The plastic culture system will increase yield, give a better fruit size, increase quality, a better uniformity, efficiency, a season extension, and a better reliability. On the East Coast, uh, the growers all use the same suppliers for plastic culture, material, and mechanics. Therefore, the general specification are pretty much standard. Let's go rapidly through the most important. So we use a black plastic mulch uh, from 0.9 to 1.25 mil. This depends on the duration of the crop mainly. The longer, the thicker. Uh, the bed height is from 8 to 12 inches. This will depend on the type of soil and the bed shaper we, we use. Genera generally, the higher is the better, with better drainage, more heat. But in practice, the standard is more around 10 inches. The bed width is from 20 to 30 inches. The distance between the beds is from 48 to 60 inches. This really depends on the bedding equipment you will use and ultimately depends on the distance between the tractor wheel. Distance between the plants is 12 inches and distance between the row is from 12 to 14 inches on the bed. This depends on the bed size. You need to remember that plant must be keep at least at least uh, six inches from the bed shoulder, so fruit don't lay on the ground and don't get dirty. And finally, the density is between 15,000 and 22,000 plants per acre. This will depends on all the other distances stated above, but mostly the distance the distances between rows. Uh, normally, about half of nitrogen and potash, with all the phosphorus and micronutrients, are applied broadcast before shaping the bed. The other half of nitrogen and potash is applied through drip irrigation, but I think John will probably explain us a lot more about that later on. Sprinklers are used for plant establishment and for frost protection. Row covers are also widely used for frost protection and for season extension. So now I, I want to give you a brief overview of the different growing system that we use to stretch our picking season in Quebec. Those next results and slides uh, come from a, a very innovative grower in Quebec called David Lemire from Ferme Gagnon, who has been very kind to share this information with us today. This grower is located in the middle range climate of the province and is often considered by his peer as our, our barometer for picking season and average yield potential. Then he, he represents the average between the coolest and the warmest growing zone.
So, okay, well, I'm sorry here. Uh, the slides title are in French. I just couldn't change them, but I'm, I'm sure you will understand. On the top graphic, uh, for all the following graphic, you will have the trends in prices on our local market, which you can see is greatly linked with the, avi the availability on fruit, uh, of fruits on the market. So this is, uh, on the left, the price for uh, a 10-pound box. And on the bottom graph, you will see how we are using different systems to fill the harvest season. Horizontally, you have the picking dates from June to October, and vertically, you have the yield that is picked per week of harvest from each hectare of field. On this first slide, you can see prices on the top graph and yields on the bottom graph, in blue for the matted row system and in red for the day neutral system that we use uh, with bare root plants. And then over the last few years, we've added a lot a lot uh, many new growing system so in light blue uh, more recently we had a jewel plug plants that give an earlier cropping pattern starting at least two weeks before the matted row to pick even earlier our company nova fruit introduced a new early variety called clary shown here with the yellow line it will start to crop three weeks before jewel in matted row and will be almost done picking with pr when prices get lower and finally, and this is our subject, we added day neutral varieties uh, using plug plants shown by the purple line instead of bare root plants shown by the red line. Plugs of seascape give a very early crop, followed by a continuous picking all through October. Nowadays, there are basically two ways of growing day neutrals in the Northeast, depending on the plant type. The most popular system is to plant during springtime with bare root dormant plants. And the alternative system is to plant late summer with plug plants. Today in Quebec, the spring planted bare roots are used on 80% of the acreage, while plugs are used on 20% of the fields. Quebec growers are annually putting in the ground 8 million plants of seascape and a few other day neutrals. Bare root dormant plants have been the standard plight for many years in the matted row and plastic culture system. They are grown for a full season in the nursery field, dug in the late fall, and kept in the cooler during winter. They are very adaptable and provide many opportunities to use in different growing systems, as well as being relatively cheap compared to other plant types. Plugs are runner tips that have been rooted in peat-based media. They are also called misted tips in other areas. They are rooted in the nurseries in July and planted in the field late August in Quebec. Plug plants cut, cost at least double the price of bare roots, so it is a more risky business, but they also give an earlier production, better fruit quality, and they can to some extent be planted mechanically. So let's come back to the bare root and let me describe the spring planting system uh, with bare roots that we used to grow day neutrals. These fields are, are treated as, a, as an annual crop. As soon as possible in April, the first thing that growers do is shape their bed, lay plastic, and put the bare roots in the ground, as you can see on this picture. And this is what it looked like a few days after planting. The flowers are removed during four to six weeks to help the plant build up a good leaf canopy that will support the summer crop. If the plants are too weak at the beginning of the harvest in July, they will lag behind all summer long. We always try to keep in mind marketing consideration and the fruits from those first flower would be harvested at the end of June when the prices are at their lowest range. So the decision for us is easy to make and we cut, and we cut the flowers uh, until mid-June and this is to support a stronger crop that will last until fall. If a good plant balance is maintained and the crop is kept free of pathogen, Fruit production can last until the end of October and even a little later in November with the use of row covers. The growers are picking in average 25,000 pounds per acre on day neutrals, about 1.3 pounds per plant, making this system among the most productive in the north. However, uh, however uh, uh, a lot of cost and risk are involved into this business, making it very challenging. All the profitability is based on one single season, so it can easily become an economical disaster if something goes wrong. 
An infestation of spider mites, tarnished plant bugs, or even powdery mildew can greatly affect the, the crop quality and yields. Some of the bare root they uh, some of the bare root day neutral fields are overwintered to give an early spring crop the following spring. If the yields were low during the first year, it can still give a good second crop. However, in our nurtured conditions, a planting that has given 25,000 pounds per acre the first year will have very big and ramified plants, and those plants will tend to give small fruit of lesser quality the second year. This system of holding seascape plants for a second year is well known by the buyers here, who state that we should not start our picking season with such a low quality fruit. It is partly as an answer to that, uh, to that demand that strawberry growers have started to use plug plants. So over the last five years, an increasing proportion of day neutral plantings in Quebec have been done with plug plants. Now, more than 20% of day neutral plantings in our province are done with plugs, and it is still increasing every year. Plugs are planted late August. Then the plants are grown late in the fall under a row cover and they are in perfect conditions to build up those flower buds that will give a very early quality spring crop. With plugs, the flowers don't need to be cut like with dormant plants because plugs are already re uh, well established since the previous fall. So you can get a very early June crop of about 15,000 pounds per acre. Here you can see the difference in the cropping pattern between bare root and plugs. As you can see, the plug harvest is very early and gives us a very good premium price for the first week of picking. On this side for 2008, plugs have been more productive than bare root by only 10%, but we often reach 20 to 25% increase in yield with plug plants. However, we need to consider that plugs are two to three times more expensive than bare roots and that there is a real risk of winter damage on the plug that you, we don't have to deal with with the spring plantings that are treated as an annual crop. So now that you know the general pattern, let me show you a few things about, uh, tr plugs, and, uh, about plugs that we have discovered recently. One of the advantages with late plantings is that you can manipulate those plants in different ways depending on what you are looking for. So here is the first scenario. This is what will happen if we put the plugs in the ground in September, so late planting, and if we don't push them too hard in the fall. The, fl the following spring, this is what you will get. These late planted plugs will give a very early crop of high quality fruit. Uh, the spring yield, however, will be lower it can be less than 10,000 pounds per acre, but after a 3-4 week gap, the plants will come back with a very heavy production in August and September, which is almost as good as with bare root plants. Then, the second scenario, with the red line. This is if we push the plant as much as we can during the planting year. So, for example, we plant early in August, we put the row covers early, we fertilize and water a lot in the fall, this will tend to give a very strong plant in the spring that will crop a little later than the, than the late planting, but that will give a very heavy spring crop. It can range, it can range from 12,000 pounds to sometimes more than 15,000 pounds per acre with seascape in our area. However, it seems that we cannot cheat the plant and that there is a maximum yield potential for a certain variety in a certain field. Here on this graph, both systems have given the same, 24, uh, the same total of 24 tons per hectare uh, in this trial. What happens most of the time is that after the heavy spring crop in early June, the plants are getting tired and the late summer yields are always lower than with the bare root plants. This reduction in harvest gets even worse in situations where the, the spring yield is higher and where the climate is warmer. So at the end, you more or less get the same yield with the early planting than with the late planting, but the picking are staggered differently over the season. I would like to uh, come back to the slides I've shown earlier from a Quebec grower called David Lemire. Uh, now that we know that we can manipulate the plants, this very ingenious grower started figuring out how, he could, how we could fill the gap between short days and day neutrals in the middle of the summer. 
So let me show you on, on the screen. Well, this part here. He has experimented different techniques to find out that if we leave just a few flowers in the spring for a very early crop, and if we cut all the flowers that comes out during the last three weeks of May, we can this way bring the gap earlier in June and come back later on in July with a better production than if we would have than if we would uh, leave all the flowers on. So this is what it will give. This flower management treatment gives this brown curve that fits right when we right when we need more fruits and when the prices are at, at their highest range. So as you can see, we now can pick strawberries on a regular base all the way from June to October by managing the different growing systems and plant types. As many, of you, uh, as many of you already know, there are many developments in Europe concerning substrate production, high tunnels, and greenhouses. Denitrols are grown in many countries as UK, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and so on. The trend is to cover the crops with high tunnels and with greenhouses. As denitrol varieties benefit a lot from this protection and from a longer picking season, in some countries almost 100% of denitrols are grown under protection. Substrate production on hanging gutters has also become very popular, and most European breeding programs on denitrols are developing varieties for that particular application. I will not get into details today. Uh, uh, because this would make another conference, but I just want you to realize that much is to come with the neutral varieties and that we are just at the beginning of a major revolution for northern growers. I often uh, show this, uh, this sentence in conference, uh, this sentence I heard from Peter Vinson in the United Kingdom. 20 years ago, we had 20 different varieties in one growing system. Now we have 20 ways of growing the same variety. It really reflects well the trend our, grower, our growing or following with day neutral varieties. So if you wish to have more details, I invite you to visit our website at www.novafruit.ca where you can find all the different graphs and the different growing systems we are using here. Our plug plant nursery, which you can see here, is located southeast of Montreal in Canada. Our goal is to grow the best strawberry plugs in the Northeast and supply this new emerging market. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Simone. We do have a couple of questions. Kay would like to know when would the June bearing plants be producing in your climate? Uh, okay. Well, there there is a difference of about 10 days from from the south of Montreal to the east of Quebec City, uh, but let's 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 uh, take David Lemire as an example. So we will normally start to pick the earliest planting by the latest days of May. So, for example, the clary used as, as plug plants will be picked like the 25th of May, and then the jewel as plug plant uh, will be picked from the 5th of May. And then we get into the, the bare root, short day, uh, well, I need to talk about the seascape also, that we normally be picked between the 1st and the 5th of May, if used uh, as a plug. And uh, then we get into the, the bare root plantings on plastic, that we'll start to pick around the 10th of, uh, of June. And then we get into the matted row system between the 15th and the 20th of June. And then we get into some of the programmed crop. This is another system that I haven't talked about, but we get small yields from programmed crop by the first days of July. And then from about mid-July, we get into the day, the, the day neutrals, uh, both plugs that are coming back for a second production and uh, bare roots that are coming up with their first production. So, well, it's a bit confusing, but there, there's a lot of system that we use now to spread our growing season. Thanks, Simone. And Laura McDermott would like to know, do the early seascape fruit compete well with the traditional June bears like Jewel in terms of flavor and customer acceptance? Uh, well, this is a very good question. Uh, yes, for seascape. But if we are talking about this, the seascapes that are, are uh, held for a second year, uh, no, the quality is very low, the fruit size is lower, the shelf life is lower, the taste is lower. 
while with young plantings as with plug plants or also with with uh, with bare roots but that haven't produced a lot on the first year then we can get a very good quality early in the spring what happens normally with seascape is that we get a lower quality during the warmest period of the year so in july when temperatures are very warm the the quality can decrease but early in june and later on in august uh, with seascape here we can get a very good quality fruit that can compete with uh, with jewel Marjman Glinicki from Poland would like to know about the winter hardiness with day neutrals. Oh, well, this is another very good question. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, we have such a bad quality and such bad results with overwintered seascape or Albion or any other of the day neutral that, that we grow here uh, is because of winter damage. So the plants normally in the spring are kind of weak. They push out a lot of flower, they do not have a lot of good leaf coverage or good leaf canopy to support those fruit. Uh, so this is how we get a, a low quality. Uh, one thing you need to remember with winter hardiness is that the holder the plant, the weaker it will be to, to go through winter. So with old plantings, we get those winter damage, while when we work with plug plants that are planted in August with very young tissue and very young plants that has been grown in, in the same summer, then winter resistance becomes very good. So we almost never see uh, winter damage uh, on seascape plugs, uh, while we, we most of the time see winter damage on, on the bare root plantings that, that are overwintered for a second year. But we, we need to use row covers on the plugs, and uh, in the areas where the, the snow coverage is not very good, we also use fences in the, in the field. So let's say that each 10 or 15 rows, we'll put the fence all across the field just to accumulate more snow during the winter time. Okay, are there any other questions for Simone? And you'll have a chance to ask more at the end. Okay, Kevin comes with a nice question also. Where is there not more Albion? I know that in uh, Ontario, Albion has taken a lot of place. Uh, if we talk about the bare root plants, we have a very good quality crop with Albion, but the problem is that we pick it very late. So we'll start to pick it, let's say by mid-August, we'll start to have good yield out of it. And the season is so short afterward that we just cannot pick the yield out of it. So Albion is not using our climate uh, with, uh, with bare root plants. Uh, with plug plants, the scheme is a bit different because then the establishment of the plant is done in the fall and uh, we start to pick early in the spring. So the, the growth that Albion needs to start production, it's considered as a, as a weak day neutral. So it needs a lot, a lot more time than Seascape to get established and, and to start a, a good production. Uh, in, in the spring, uh, with plug plants, we start to pick with Albion, but then if the climate stays cool, Seascape still gives better yield than Albion uh, as plug plant also. So, well, over the last four years, I would say that in the warmest region of Quebec, two years out of four, Seascape still has been better than Albion as plug plant. And in the coolest place of Quebec, in the coolest areas, uh, let's say that one year out of four Albion has been better than Seascape. So it is not adopted yet as a, as a variety. The fruit quality is wonderful, uh, but we just cannot pick the yield out of it with both types of plants. Ian McGregor would like to know what thickness of row cover you're using. Uh, well, another good question. We, uh, we, have put, we have thrown away all the, the row covers under 30 grams, so the 19 gram per square meter row covers are not used. Uh, we use row covers between 30 and 40 grams. Uh, what growers are considering now is the durability of those row covers uh, versus the price. And we realize that investing in heavier row covers like the 42 grams or even the 60 gram or du double layer of, of 40 grams uh, g gives us a longer durability. So, uh, well, 30 to 40, uh, 30 to 40 grams per, per square meter w would be the average uh, in the row covers used. Okay, Simone will be back with us again uh, at the end to answer more questions. Um, we'll take this one more from Rajmund. Uh, oh, it's a comment he has. Uh, he agrees with Simone about Albion that the fruits are too late and the yield is low. 
And Simone, thank you very much, and please stay with us. Um, and now I want to introduce to you our second speaker, Mr. John Zanstra. John completed his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture and Master of Science at the University of Guelph and has been with the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus since 1994. He's responsible for conducting uh, cropping systems research on fruit and vegetable crops in southwestern Ontario. John is presently the coordinator of the Agriculture and Horticulture Diploma programs at Ridgetown campus and also teaches courses in fruit and vegetable crop management. He manages the Cedar Springs Fruit Research Station, which is located on the north shore of Lake Erie, 15 kilometers east of the town of Blenheim. The main focus in the fruit research program for the past few years is the development of cropping systems for day-neutral strawberries, including high tunnel production. John? Hello. Am I here? You are here. I am here. I'm a radio celebrity. This is cool. Um, just to reflect what uh, what Simon has said, it's an interesting way to, to uh, bring this information across, so we're happy to be here. Um, maybe just update again or add to what you had uh, included. The, the, the site that we're working on is kind of midway between um, London and Windsor, Ontario, so we're about an hour and a half to the east of, of Detroit, uh, so, so North Shore Lake Erie, a warmer production area. We have a fair bit of trouble with production during the hotter part of the summer, and I'll allude to that a little bit. So what I want to do is just go over a little bit of background, why we're interested in irrigation, especially in a day-neutral system. Um, talk a little bit about your irrigation, because you have to have a good handle on your irrigation system if you're going to be adding fertilizer through it. A few comments on fertilizer selection, um, micronutrients, and then considerations and rates and, and some of the techniques that we use to, to put fertilization in. I also want to go over a little bit of our a little bit of our um, current research that we're doing, and um, and then just finish off some micronutrients. And I see that I've got a comment about speaking loud. Is everybody able to hear me all right? Are we good for you there, Kathy? John, no, you need to be louder. How do I? Okay, I've got this thing cranked up, but anyhow, we will try to talk a little bit louder. All right. So why fertigate? Well, we've got a we've got a day neutral system. We've got uh, raised beds and plastic and a drip tape, so why not put fertigation in there? It's a, it's a logical um, a logical extension of a typical day-neutral production system and relative to or compared to, say, putting everything on as dry fertilizer in the spring. Uh, some of the, the published benefits of fertigation, and many of these will apply to a strawberry system, you, you can feed the crop as it needs it. Uh, there's a little bit being done at this point in terms of targeting uh, different rates of fertility based on plant development. But I understand there's some work in Europe where they're they're actually targeting the fertility based on, say, the flower development of the crop. But um, it's something we can move ahead with. But but it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of feeding the crop. You're putting the nutrition right where the plant needs it in the root zone. It's it's available. It's efficient. It, um, we see we see. Uh, Information um, suggesting savings of upwards of uh, say 20, 30 percent in, in terms of fertilizer because you're you're getting it to the plant when it needs it and, and, and in a form that's quite available. So you're you've got some savings there. Uh, so you've got product savings, um, possible labor, machinery, fuel savings because you're not having to go through the field and, and do it mechanically. And lastly, um, your leaching potential isn't there. Um, you manage where it goes through irrigation water. Um, it's it's not going to be put on early in the season, and then you're at the at the uh, you're you're working with the weather to try and, and keep it where it is. So so uh, you're able to work with that a little bit better, and that's some of the focus that we've been working on as well, looking at application efficiencies. So we want to talk a little bit about irrigation. Um, you can't talk about fertigation without knowing your irrigation system well and 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 um, making it as efficient as possible. It's important to irrigate well. It's important to make sure that the irrigation is put on uniformly, and I'm, I'm taking a quote out of one of the references that I used, uh, a, a booklet uh, titled Fertigation, and the comment there is distribution of fertigation can't be better than, than the distribution of water. So you're carrying one with the other. You've got to make sure you're putting it in the root zone. You want to give the plants adequate water, but you certainly want to make sure that you're getting it into the zone where the strawberry is going to take it up. So if you're, if you're flushing it all through, you're, uh, you're not doing a very good job of it. So having things consistent in terms of your irrigation approach is good. So 
things you want to consider when you're irrigating for one um, weather conditions, evapotranspiration, how much is is being used by the plant, how much is being released by the soil, how much irrigation water needs to go back on. You need to consider the maturity of the crop um, as it gets bigger, as it starts to hang a, a crop, as the plant increases in size, it's going to affect the amount of, of water that needs to be put back. Um, if you've not fertigated or irrigated strawberries extensively and you've worked with other types of crops before, it's, it's not a, a straight crossover. So you've got to consider the plant, the size of the plant again, the, the leaf area that's involved. So a lot of considerations uh, need to be to be uh, put into place when you're when you're developing uh, an effective irrigation system. You also need to be familiar with your soil, how much water is available to the plant. Um, you've got to know the rooting depth of your plant. Uh, you, you, you need to uh, consider how able that plant is to extract the water. And so for strawberries, some suggestions in the literature um, indicate that strawberries will root up to about 60 centimeters. I think that's a bit extreme, especially in the, in the sites that we're on. We're not getting it uh, that deep. But anyhow, get some idea of, of the effective area that the, the plant is rooting into. Um, a shovel would, would be an easy way to, to confirm that. Um, but again, just, just uh, make sure that when you're putting the water on, which is carrying the fertilizer, that you're not moving it past the zone or you're not putting on enough and not getting into the zone of, of, uh, of the roots of the plant. Uh, the, some of the parameters I talked about earlier, um, the evapotranspiration, the rooting depth, the water holding capacity of the plant, you can plug these into models and, and calculate how much water needs to be added and when it needs to be done. Uh, these models are quite effective and I've used a number of them in the past and you can get quite accurate in terms of, of replacing the water that's being used. It's kind of running a spreadsheet and, and topping up at the end of the day or, or every couple of days. Uh, so that's one approach. You can also use um, monitoring equipment. I've listed a few things here, tensiometers, TDRs, things that uh, are getting more affordable and, and growers might be able to use and are, are somewhat uh, are fairly reproducible in terms of the numbers that they give you. Uh, but again, um, even running irrigation, going out and, and digging and, and finding out where it is, just to make sure that you're putting it in, in, in the zone where it needs to be. So, so uh, with these monitoring techniques or this monitoring equipment, you can easily see when that band of water comes through. They respond fairly quickly to, to uh, irrigation water being added, and that way uh, keep, keep track of, of uh, where the water is going and effectively where your irrigation is. I think people don't really realize a lot of the time how far water will move. And this is a, a table that I've picked out of, again, one of the, the booklets that I use as a reference. And what it does is relates soil texture and moisture content of the soil um, to the depth that the water will go if you're, say, putting an inch of water on, on a particular soil. So I'm kind of flipping here between imperial and metric, my apologies, but I, I, um, I didn't have time to convert this. But for example, if you've got, say, a sandy loam soil and it's at a 50% water holding capacity, um, if you put an inch of water on that, that, that water will, will soak down about 16 inches into the soil. So it's, it's moving a fair distance. Um, and if you're dealing with a strawberry crop, you might be moving somewhat out of where that plant is actually able to pick up that, that fertility. So you need to be aware of that and, and, uh, and again, keep that in mind whenever you're, you're moving and, and uh, putting, putting water on the, on the plant. Okay, fertigation or fertilizer selection. There's a, uh, there's a wide range of products that you can use, and I guess the simplest thing is just to go get some fertilizer that you would put on the field. It's, it's a little more complicated than getting a mixture, but it certainly is, is cheaper. Um, just a few cautions there. If you're, if you're using, say, granular fertilizer, you, you always need to do a test. You always need to do a, a combination of what you're putting on, do a jar test, use the actual irrigation water. Um, in particular, if you're using, say, um, phosphate fertilizers and you've got other, other formulations with calcium in it, or if your water is extremely hard and you're putting in, say, phosphate or sulfate compounds, you, you can get precipitates. So put it in a jar, use the actual irrigation water, mix it up, let it sit there for a day, and if there's any type of, of uh, precipitate or gunk in the water, you, you don't want to go out in the field with that. You don't want to plug up your emitters. Uh, it can be problematic. If you're using prepared formulations intended for fertigation or liquid fertilizers, you're usually fairly fairly safe and it's not an issue, but um, there is always that uh, that temptation or, or that opportunity to to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, use commercial fertilizers or granular. So 
So that's there. You also have to keep in mind the, the solubility of these fertilizers, and they're usually quite soluble. But there are there are uh, tables and charts out there that that give you information on the relative solubilities. Ones again to keep in mind. Say if you're using ammonium nitrate type fertilizers, they vary in their solubility depending on the temperatures. Um, uh, ammonium sulfate, uh, ammonium nitrate are a couple examples where that will change. So, so uh, be familiar with what you're using. Make sure it is quite soluble and it'll go into solution. Um, but the uh, the other approach then is is just to get um, just to get regular pre-made fertilizers. Uh, just to give a bit of information, or just to uh, review some of the information, or some of the macronutrients and and the way they move in in solution and uh, the way they're taken up by the plant. Uh, forms of nitrogen are um, are different in terms of plant response, and and um, a little bit of information on that is helpful. So plants normally take up nitrogen as nitrate. Small amounts are taken up as ammonium directly by the plant. Nitrate is is the uh, the concern in terms of leaching out of the soil volume. It uh, it's a negatively charged or it's a negatively charged ion. It's not held by the soil. It moves readily in the soil solution. It'll it'll leach quite easily. Ammonium, on the other hand, is positively charged. It doesn't move very well. It's um, it's held quite well by the soil. It doesn't move far in the soil profile, but it's readily converted to nitrates by soil organisms and then the plant will take it up so so if you do put a lot of nit or ammonium on it does get converted eventually depending on the soil and and soil temperatures and such but but um it is giving you a bit of a, a buffer there because it does um it does stay um in the soil doesn't move around fairly quickly now feeding with high levels of either form in a fertigation system can affect the uh the uptake of other nutrients, it's, it's generally recommended that you have a balance of the two in your fertigation program. Uh, so if you're if you're leaning towards heavy levels of, of nitrate or heavy levels of ammonium, they can upset other nutrients in terms of their uptake. Um, they can they can interfere with other metabolic processes in the plant. So generally, they recommend that you 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 use a, a fairly good mixture of the two. Um, some some uh, actual figures that I've come across are say no more than 50% ammonium, uh, no more than 60% nitrate in a mixture. We do find examples in the literature where they're looking specifically at strawberries and looking at different ratios of the two and uh, there are suggestions that strawberries prefer nitrate over ammonium and I've, I've uh, even heard suggestions that one over the other will promote vegetative growth more than, than reproductive growth and you may want to use that early in the season to, to, to uh, enhance plant growth but but typically a mixture of the two is good not um, not moving too far in one direction or the other um, a few comments on phosphorus soil phosphorus as a whole is is um, not terribly available it's slowly mineralized and, and released in the plant it tends to bind fairly tightly availability is best at uh, say between six and seven soil ph uh, generally pre planting ple Pre-plant incorporation is is more economical when you're dealing with a a uh, particular strawberry crop. Um, some of the considerations there, when you're transplanting, you want it to be there. So unless you've got your beds down, uh, sorry, uh, uh, your, your irrigation in place, and you've started to put some phosphate down, it's likely a good idea to have enough in the soil when the plants go in, either as a plug or as a bare root plant, just to stimulate root development. Uh, get the roots going. If you put some in as a transplant solution, be a good idea. But, but to uh, to try and rely on a fertigation system to put it all there might not be the most effective way to do it. Uh, with with long season crop like strawberry, some suggest it might be useful to add a bit through the fertigation. But in general, it's it's put down all pre-plant and then it's uh, made a, it's available to the plant throughout the season. Plants don't really require an awful lot of it relative to to nitrogen or, or, or uh, potash, so pre-planted incorporation of most of it is usually uh, a good way to go. Potash as well, most of our soils have adequate potash, it's, it's really only a small amount that's available to the plant, um, and there's this equilibrium in the soil between fixed potash and available potash. Uh, it too, a fair portion of it is often pre-planted incorporated, it doesn't move far in the soil, it, it's often well available to the plant, but we often like to to add a little bit through the fertigation. There, there's uh, fruit quality uh, issues associated with with extra potash, and uh, it's again something that that we tend to put a little bit in the in the fertigation solution just to make sure that 
that uh, enough is there, enough is available to the plant. And in some cases, it's it's uh, recognized that even though the soil has a lot there, um, that the amount that is available to a plant at, at any given time just isn't enough to to provide adequate growth and development. So we'll add a little bit to uh, to the uh, fertigation solution as well. So when you're starting to fertigate, obviously the first thing you want to do is test your soil. Uh, if there is adequate amounts there, you may not want to add any more through the fertigation solution. Um, you want to make sure you know what uh, what is there so you're not spending extra money putting putting material on that you don't need. You want to make sure your soil pH is in a range that that uh, provides optimum uptake of the nutrients and, and optimum growth for the for the strawberry. Depending on where where you look and, and where you're located, it can vary, but generally between six and a half and say seven two seven three is the pH range that we talk about. Don't see a lot of reference in the literature about testing irrigation water, but I don't think it's a bad idea to do that either. Again, just to make sure that that you don't have any high levels of particular nutrients in your water or to make sure that you're not uh, having to deal with really hard water or water where the pH is off and it's going to mess up your, your nutrient availability. So know what you're getting into and, and um, know, know what your soil is like, know what your water quality is like, just to, to be able to uh, not have to worry about those issues and, and uh, make sure that you're, you're in good shape there. Some of the things to consider when you're you're trying to determine the rates of, of fertigation. Um, so I talked about how much is supplied by the soil and the water. Um, again, in terms of the soil, what your previous crops are in terms of nitrogen. Is there any residue there that's going to be providing extra nitrogen or residual nitrogen in the soil? Um, keep in mind with strawberries as well that if you're dealing with a crop that overwinters, usually early spring growth in the strawberry, a lot of the the nutrition a lot of the nutrition comes from the plant itself, uh, the crown of the plant, at least for the first few weeks of growth. So you may not have to feed it quite as heavy at that point. Um, when the plant requires the nutrient, well, again, that's still uh, not terribly clear with strawberries. We're not um, we're not really advanced in that area, so that's hopefully something that'll come along down the line, so we can more uh, more effectively feed the plant at particular areas when it's looking for nutrient. So what rates do I use? Um, P and K, um, again, just general rates. They don't have a real big growth response in terms of strawberry development. Nitrogen is one we concern ourselves with most. Depending on where you are, I, I really can't give any specific uh, recommendations, obviously, but um, you need to consider, again, what your soil is like, where uh, where you're growing, what your, your, uh, your seasonal length is. If you survey the literature, um, particularly in particularly in North America, we see rates anywhere from uh, no response to additional nitrogen upwards of of uh, three quarters of a kilo of nitrogen per hectare per day. So again, soil type will have a big effect on that. Um, in general, it's felt that growers use more than they really need. It uh, might be seen as a as an insurance policy, but um, a lot of the time. Uh, you really don't need to put on as much as you as you are. Um, if you're getting more than you need, either you you run the risk of losing it through through leaching in the soil, but also a big lush plant isn't a good thing. It's well documented that say botrytis and thracnose uh, incidence is higher if you've you've got high nitrogen rates. Uh, fruit quality is poor, storage is poor. So there are a lot of a lot of drawbacks to having too much nitrogen in your in your uh, in your fertigation as well. I was at a, a talk a few days ago, and this fellow was talking about grape production, and his comment there was, we're not wood growers, we're fruit growers, and I guess you could sort of see the same with strawberries. You want a certain size of plant, but too much uh, nitrogen in particular, is you're growing a lot of extra leaf there, and, and it may not be necessary, and it may cause you more trouble than you uh, than you actually are, more problems than, than benefits. In terms of application of, of fertigation, you want to be um, below a 1% solution in your final mixture. So you make up your stock solution and there's a number of ways to get it into the into the fertigation or into the irrigation lines. Some sources say upwards of 5%. Um, others are more cautious and say really don't want more than 1%. But the concern is damage to the roots, uh, just shoving too much in there and, and causing trouble. Um, it varies with again with the formulation, the electrical conductivity of the particular formulation, and and what type of plant you're dealing with. But it is a good line, a good guideline to go by. So our solutions never are more than one percent. Um, depends on how quickly you put them on as well. But uh, again, it's a good guideline to prevent any problems in the field. 
Uh, we try to get our applications of uh, fertigation on fairly quickly. So what we'll do is we prime the system, make sure everything's running well, get water through uh, through all the drip tape. We try to get our fertigation on within a half an hour. Generally, they suggest within a half to uh, to an hour. You don't want to go longer than that because you tend to dilute things. And again, you want to keep it in that zone of, of use by the plant. And then when it's all done, we'll flush the system again for another 10 or 15 minutes. What we're concerned with there is, is uh, uniformity across the field. If you've got rolling topography, you may get more settling in the low areas. Uh, so you just want to make sure that, that, that the, uh, the uniformity of application is, is maintained. So, so we'll flush afterwards. It um, seems to work well, and then you keep track of your soil moisture and add more if you need to. But um, the actual fer fertigation application tends to be fairly short. Now, you can also base what you put on uh, in terms of what the plant uses. And I've, I've found a few sources um, on the internet, actually, which, which suggest where uh, or how much the strawberry plant uses over, over a, a cropping system. One of them only, only one of them, I should say, really indicated what the size of the crop was. And, and um, of the three, two were fairly, fairly close in, in terms of uh, how much the crop actually used. But say, for example, uh, nitrogen. Uh, with this 30-ton crop, there was kind of a range, but anywhere between, say, 57 and, and 78 kilos per hectare um, is taken up by the fruit and the plant to produce that 30 ton crop. Um, phosphorus is, is fairly low, potash is somewhere within that range. The, 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 uh, the sources that I found again ranged anywhere from 63 to 92, uh, magnesium 8 to 19. So, so you can kind of get an idea from that what you need to be adding to your plant if you're interested in just replacing what is used by the plant. You also need to again consider what is coming out of the out of the soil itself? What is being mineralized, and and also what is being remobilized in the plant? But those are the sorts of of numbers that are actually being used to to produce this crop, and and uh, in particular the nitrogen levels are fairly in, a, in fairly good agreement with, with what we're finding in uh, in the fertigation work that we're doing. So again, just an idea of what's being taken up by the plant. The last column is just a breakdown of, of what percentage the the fruit is using per, uh, compared to what percentage of that nutrient is, is going into the plant and maintaining the plant. So just to overview some of the work that we're doing, we've been uh, looking at fertigation over a number of years in Ontario uh, simply because we don't have local recommendations or grower base recommendations on, uh, on uh, other locations in North America. We've got two production sites, one in the, in the Cedar Springs station where we are and one at the Simcoe Research Station. Our soil is, is fairly loamy. Um, we've got a, a pH of, of uh, where we where we want at 6.6, .6. organic matter of, of about three and a half or 3.3 percent, but compared to a, a coarse sandy soil on the Simcoe site. So what we did on these locations is um, we were both grew or we grew seascape at both sites. Our populations were a little bit lower at Cedar Springs. We had a range of nitrogen rates anywhere from zero to 150 kilos per hectare um, over the season. Uh, we would usually start in mid-May and run to about mid-October in, in, in terms of fertigation. Our timing was, or sorry, uh, another treatment was timing where we would start our uh, fertigation program later in the season. We would put on 75 kilos, but we would also we would uh, start it in later July, so we would load the back end of the season more with, with the nitrogen. And then lastly, we had a 75 kilo per hectare treatment, at, but we would also put extra potash with it to see if there was any effect um, in respect to that nutrient. In Simcoe, it was a smaller trial because it's a ways away. We only use three rates of nitrogen, same variety, the, the seascape variety. In this case, a commercial grower came in and put the beds in, so our, our populations were a little bit higher. Um, and we also had a white plastic on that site, which uh, we find is a little bit better, but we started with black in Cedar Springs, so we continued on. So we had three rates of nitrogen in Simcoe, and we also had the, uh, the, timing, um, the timing treatment, so... 75 kilos per hectare, but beginning a little later in the season, so so the applications uh, were a little bit larger at every given time. We put them on with a dosmatic, which is a, a commercial diluter. Um, can certainly be used in a field situation. Uh, we determined our rates based on total land area, not the area under plastic, just to make the, the calculations easier and have it uh, relate to the growers better. And we we worked on a 17-week period. So, for example, our 75 kilos per hectare is about 4.4 kilos of nitrogen per week, and, and I think that's about 0.6 kilos uh, per day. So we started applications in mid-May, finished in mid-October. In, um, 
The nitrogen source that we use is 28% is, uh, liquid, which is a, a combination of urea and, and ammonium nitrate. And in our potash treatments, we added um, a potassium nitrate and then topped it off with 28% liquid just to give us our, our 75 kilos per hectare nitrogen. In Cedar Springs, um, we really had no significant difference amongst treatments. Now, what you're seeing here is, is our fall crop. So our planting system or production system that we follow is we plant in May. We, we harvest, say, late July, early August through, um, through the fall. And then we'll keep that crop over the winter and we'll do a spring flush. And so we'll start to harvest again, say, mid-May and go to about maybe late June, July. And uh, that's that's what we mean by fall and by spring. So fall crop year of planting. Um, and again, on a per year basis, no statistical difference. I've put the three years together. I've not done the stats on this, but you can see there's not a huge response in terms of increasing nitrogen rates. Uh, maybe a bit of a trend increase when we get up to say 25, 75 kilos per hectare. What I find interesting is we're seeing a bit of a boost if we're putting on that uh, fertility late. So there seems to be a bit of advantage, at least in the first year, uh, the year of planting, of, of putting more in later in the season versus earlier in the season. And the thought is just getting that crop developed um, and feeding it later in the season to get it going. If you uh, if you look at the following year, the spring crop, so this is the, the crop the year after it was planted again, no real response in terms of nitrogen rate as we go across from 0 to 25 to 75. And they're even tending to decline as we get into the higher nitrogen rates. Uh, no real benefit there of, of putting a late crop in, or sorry, a late uh, nitrogen application or loading it up late in the season. And uh, we, we, we really don't see a huge benefit at this point either of the high potash. It's fairly similar to what our, our uh, best treatment is in terms of just the, um, the overall nitrogen rate. So, so we didn't see a huge benefit in, in terms of adding that extra potash on this site. Now in, in Cedar Springs, we were... Um, We've got this high organic or high organic matter, three and a half percent organic matter. In some of our early season soil tests, we were finding that we were getting about 20 part per million of nitrate available to the plant, which they tell me equates to about 70, 80 pounds of actual nitrogen. So we had a fairly good rate of nitrogen available to those plants early on in the season, which which may explain why we're not getting any response to to uh, applied nitrogen in our fertigation. If we look at Simcoe in our fall crop, it's on a coarser soil, it's a sandier soil, and you can see on the top graph is, is uh, our marketable yield in response to nitrogen, and we can see there's a fairly good response to, to increasing rates of nitrogen as we would expect. Um, and here again, in, in the fall, in the year of planting in our fall crop, we're seeing a bit of a boost by putting on the, um, the nitrogen, having more put on later in the season versus evenly across the entire production season. If we uh, look at the wind or the the spring crop in the same planting again, we're seeing this rate increase as we're going from zero upwards to to 125 kilos per hectare. The the benefit of the late app applied nitrogen in terms of marketable yield really isn't there, similar to what we saw in Cedar Springs. So so uh, uh, seeing the same sort of trend there, but but obviously on this coarse soil, um, we're seeing more of a response to nitrogen than we are on the on the uh, the loamier ground so so um, here too we don't see a real response on the loams when we get into uh, the sandier soils there seems to be more of a, a response because likely the just the, the lack of, of or the lower organic matter the the higher rate of of um, of uh, leaching if, if it's there um, so not completely unexpected okay moving on to micronutrients um, a lot of a lot of people try to, to sell sell you micronutrients. Um, my philosophy on that is unless you know you've got a problem, um, if your soil is well maintained, if your pH is good, if you've got good good healthy production practices, I, I don't really see a, a use in that. Um, my suggestion, which I've heard from others, is, is if you want to get a baseline uh, of what micronutrients should be in your crop, we do have recommendations in Ontario of, of what the, the level of nutrients nutrients in the plant should be uh, based on tissue samples. But if you want to know what it's like on your own site, um, go to an area on your farm where you've got good production, where you're happy with, with how the plants are performing and they look healthy. Um, take some tissue samples, um, send them to the lab, kind of get a baseline of, of what 
is in your plants at that particular location. And then if you run into trouble, uh, you can compare them to that. You can see where you're, you're uh, getting, getting into trouble and, and uh, may explain some problems that you're seeing if there are, in fact, micronutrient deficiencies. There are suggestions in the literature of, of high boron requirements. Uh, we've not seen that on our sites. Um, we don't really spend a lot of time putting boron on. Uh, the only one that I'm really familiar with is is um, is iron. And Becky Hughes, who works for the University of Guelph in our in a northern location, regularly um, adds foliar iron to her day neutrals because of uh, because of a deficiency she's got there on the clay. But um, certainly not something that we've seen where we are. Um, where we are in, in, in our site. Um, this is a, a series of, of samples that I took um, early on when we started working with day neutrals. We weren't really familiar with them. This is the, the second year crop. So this is the year after planting. This is a seascape crop at our Cedar Springs site. Um, we talk off about 19 and a half tons per hectare on, on this particular planting and we were fertigating with a a complete blend uh, triple 20 and, and putting on about uh, 0.6 kilo per hectare per day and we would put them on once a week and so um we were we were seeing some symptoms under our tunnels this is the outside uh production where i was taking the samples from but we were seeing some some symptoms that we weren't really sure uh were were, were we weren't really sure what was going on and so uh, the concern was micronutrients so we started sampling and we tried to get in every two weeks and and uh, take fully expanded leaves recently expanded leaves so they were fairly young and and um, analyzing the petioles of them and uh, in, the, in the second column that's the recommended rates in Ontario we can see the dates as we go across what our nutrient status was and the red uh, the red numbers uh, indicate where we were falling below the Ontario recommended rates and you can see there's a few cases where Nitrogen was dipping a little bit, but certainly we weren't wildly low in our rates. Um, potash again, a little, a few times mid-season where we were getting below the recommended rates, but but uh, not moving out in any any great degree. So, so um, it really wasn't anything to do with nutrition, and we realize now that it was more heat stress on the plants than anything. But um, it was just a nice way to to kind of see where we're going, what our nutrient status was, in particular the micros, and and uh, just managing them without putting any great effort on micros. We weren't seeing any big problems there, and 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 no big differences. So just some general comments to summarize the fertigation topic. Um, if you're new to it, uh, start simple, become comfortable with your irrigation system and your your fertigation systems. Again, uniformity is, is important in putting the water down and then when the, the fertility is carried along with it, hopefully that will, will follow the same trend. Um, soil testing and tissue testing are good indications of, of what's available in the soil and what's getting into the plant and it'll, it'll set up some guidelines for you. And in all cases, make sure your record keeping is good, what products you were using, what rates you were putting on, if you were happy with the condition of your plants, if you think your yield potential was there. You can always go back and look at those and they give you a good indication of, of what was going on. As you move on, you can refine them. Um, one of the questions I've got is whether more in free or more frequent, smaller doses of, of fertility are applicable. Um, kind of thinking in terms of vegetable transplant production where where daily applications we find are more efficient and, and easier to do than, than say weekly applications. Um, applications based on, on plant growth is something I think that is up and coming and, and might be interesting, but we I don't think we really have the information on that yet. Uh, differences in variety. Um, we wonder if Albion just needs a little bit more to push it along because it, it tends to be a little slower maturing as Simon mentioned, but, but also it, it tends to, we think, need a little bit more in, in terms of, of, uh, of growing the plant. And then just sap testing on the farm. Uh, there are a number of um, instruments where you can go out into the field yourself and then test for different nutrients and, and whether that could be part of a, a fertigation program just to, to try and maintain the, the quality and the nutrient status of the plant as you go through the season. Okay, that kind of concludes what, uh, what I wanted to talk about. I've just got a list of some of the uh, books and, uh, yeah, the books that I used to, to put this together. And, and there were a number of research articles as well that, that we looked at. So, so if you want to look at them further. So thank you for your time. And, uh, yeah. Any okay. okay, John, thank you very much. There are some questions in the chat box. Uh, the first one is from Rajman Kuniki again. He's wondering if the application of multimicrobial inocula as a biofertilizer 
could be more effective in plants' growth promotion than humic acid application? Oh, I really have no experience with any of that. Um, um, yeah, I've not at all worked in that, and I really didn't focus on that when I was reviewing the literature, so sorry, I, I, I really don't know what to say in that respect. It's certainly an interesting area looking at biofertilizers, but um, it isn't something that I focused on in, in, uh, in terms of this presentation. Okay, Rod Elmstrand would like to know uh, why white plastic or black? We're in a fairly warm production area, so we prefer white. It, um, it doesn't give us a good head start in the season, but when we get into the warmer part of the summers, uh, we notice a difference on, on, uh, in terms of production and quality, so white is better. Black just gets too warm. Um, it, it, it just isn't a good situation for us. So we want to we want to be able to cool the plants or grow them in a cooler environment. Uh, I was just joking with a plastic supplier a few days ago. Ideally, it would be nice if we would have something that was black in the summer and then started to fade and and turn white later in the year. But um, the thought has been about uh, a whitewashing, and we've looked at these uh, skunk type plastics as well. But uh, the basic reason is is we're warm. We want a cooler environment for our plants, so so we use a white plastic. Kay is wondering if there's any other research with white plastic around the country or the world. So if any of our other participants have some comments on that, please feel free to weigh in. Um, Rajman has one more question about, uh, once again, if the phyte or the phosphite form of phosphorus can be considered as a fertilizer. Um, again, not, not familiar with that form of fertilizer. Not, uh, I assume again this is in the in more of the biofertilizer um, uh, approach, but sorry, not not uh, not familiar with that. Okay, Kay is wondering how your spring yield results compare to Simon's comments about the spring crop being poor. Simon, are you with us? And does the second year spring harvest happen in May, when June bearing begins in mid June? Um. Maybe just if I could start, our, in our area, our day neutrals uh, usually have a week or two a, a benefit, or earlier production than our, our, day, or than our June bears. Um, they just seem to start off earlier. Um, so if we're comparing side by side, um, day neutrals that were planted the previous year, their spring crop the following year, tends to be earlier than a, an established June bearing crop, um, just, the, just the nature of the plant. Um, our spring crop the year after planting also tends to be um, smaller. The fruit size isn't quite as big, but we, we do get a fair bit of crop in that second year. So we're going with a spring planted bare root plant that we would put in in May. Uh, we'll start to crop it again in July, late July, August, September, and as long as we can go. The second year, you, you tend to lose a bit on fruit size, but we do get a fairly decent crop in that second year. Once we get into the heat of the summer, um, at this point, we usually abandon it because it, it's the, the crowns are getting big, the plants are starting to get tired. Um, we've tried different things to carry that crop further in that second year. And we do have some growers in Ontario that, that are able to do it successfully, but I'm not really sure what they're doing, um, but we're not able to in the location that, that, uh, that we're at. Another question is if it's better to apply micronutrients, especially boron, as a foliar spray or a soil application? Uh, boron is easily applied as a foliar. Um, I think it's uh, a little less expensive putting it in the soil. Um, boron is, is tricky because you don't need an awful lot of it um, and, and often Tox to toxicity symptoms may be somewhat similar to, to deficiency symptoms. Um, I've not seen deficiency symptoms in our plots. Um, I've heard a lot of trouble with, with uh, people getting a little carried away with it, but um, uh, either way, it, it, it can be done. Um, but again, I think the, the more effective way is, is to put it on, or sorry, the more economical way is to put it on as a soil application if you know there's a problem, but, but certainly it's, it's able to be put on um, um, through foliar sprays and it is effective to do it that way. Okay, and then I believe the last question was from John Brandstratter. He's wondering if you've worked with calcium nitrate and if you could give us some input on that. 
I've not worked with calcium nitrate. It, it is um, one that that you hear people using, especially if they're if they're interested in getting more more calcium to the plant. Our soils are naturally very high in calcium, so I'm not at all concerned about about calcium in the plant. If you uh, if your your um, irrigation is timely and and consistent, calcium uptake um, isn't usually an issue for us. So um, no, I have not worked with it in particular. Uh, we we we've stuck with just the the liquid 28% as our as our major nitrate or nitrogen source. Okay then, does anyone have questions for either Simone or John? And while we're waiting, I just want to remind you that uh, the last in the mini series on day neutral strawberries, the last webinar will be next Friday, March 4th. We'll have uh, Dr. Frank Lowe's from North Carolina State University talking about diseases and their management, and Dr. David Handley from University of Maine talking about insect and mite management for day-neutral strawberries. I want to thank Simone and John for their excellent presentations, and we'll take any questions that you may have in the meantime. Okay, Michael Collins is wondering if there, you have any ideas for soluble organic fertilizers to use in drip. Uh, again, no. You're you're uh, <laughs> you're asking the wrong person. I really, I really don't. I'm not, I'm not aware of what's available in terms of, of organic fertilizers. Um, yeah, it's certainly an interesting market, but I, I just don't have any experience in that in that area. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating this week, and we'll have our third webinar in the series next week. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you.